he was a good chief. He was a good law enforcement officer the years that he was doing his, his work as a policeman and whatnot. But then several years later, he began to turn. We began to back off because he's not our type guy anymore. He was with the wrong folks. That's what it amounts to, and, and they used him because at that time he was too much whiskey, too much women, too much pills. Begin to see all this dishonesty and corruption on the coast. Corruption amongst politicians, sheriffs, police chiefs, mayors, prostitution, people being beat out of their money on, on uh, crooked gambling games. And if the crooked sheriff was in there, it increased. And we saw it, and I reported it the best I could. But other than that, we didn't have the uh, authority to just go and do some of the stuff that should have been done. And because the area was corrupt and nobody was doing anything, that was a haven. And it just grew. I'm Jed Lipinski. This is Gone South. Episode 4, Wide Open and Wicked. From the very initial dealings with the police and how certain things were handled at the house, and then the news from the neighbor that he thought he had seen a policeman the night of the murder, I think that set all of the family members' expectations from the police at a very low level. The confidence level was near non-existent. This is Leslie Miller again, the youngest of Margaret and Vince Sherry's four children. By the end of the first week, she and her family had all but lost faith in the Biloxi PD's ability to solve the case. And the police, from what we understood, were were tracking down leads, looking at his client base, getting in touch with these people, and ruling them all out, which is a good thing because you want to get to the bottom of it, but it was also frustrating because you're thinking... This wasn't random. This wasn't a robbery. This wasn't mistaken identity. This was very much a case of taking out a politician and her husband or taking out a judge slash lawyer and his wife on purpose. So someone somewhere has to know something and you people are not getting to the bottom of it. The family was encouraged by the involvement of FBI agents from Quantico. But Biloxi PD had stressed that the FBI was only providing support, not investigating the murders. Despite the formation of the task force, the BPD was still technically in charge. But unbeknownst to the Sherry family, and even to members of the BPD, the two young agents assigned to the task force were among the most talented and ambitious law enforcement officers on the Gulf Coast. Following the murders, a state and local task force was formed, and two of us, uh, meaning FBI agents, were requested to participate and assist at least in covering out-of-state leads for the local and state authorities. This is Keith Bell, a retired FBI agent who was based out of the Bureau's resident agency in Gulfport the year Margaret and Vince Sherry were killed. And the two agents were myself and uh, Special Agent Royce Hignite. So we were initially members of the state and local task force, and we did assist from time to time in a limited manner uh, in getting out-of-state leads covered by other FBI agents around the country. Keith was 41 years old at the time and already had 15 years of experience as an agent. When the cops announced they'd found what they thought to be the hitman's getaway car, he volunteered to help. I took the assignment of trying to determine where the tag came from or where it had been because it did not belong on the yellow Ford Fairmont. While crime scene investigators were still dusting the Fairmont for prints, Keith was focused on the license plate. 
A run of the plate revealed that it belonged to a brown 1975 Oldsmobile, owned by a former airman at Biloxi's Keesler Air Force Base. And I determined that it had been left on an abandoned car in an apartment complex in Biloxi, Mississippi, in 1984, and that a local locksmith had had access to that car and had removed multiple items from the car. Keith had spoken to the manager of the apartment complex where the car was abandoned. And that man had explained that he'd offered the car to a locksmith before it was hauled away. But what got Keith's attention was the locksmith's name, Lenny Sweatman. I was pretty shocked myself, you know, that when the apartment manager said, oh, We used our local locksmith. Who was that? Lenny Sweatman. He had a criminal record. He had Dixie Mafia connections and real tight with Mike Gillich. Keith was familiar with Lenny Sweatman. He was what Keith described as a gopher for the powerful Biloxi strip club owner, Mike Gillich. Keith suspected that Lenny had taken the license plate off the 75 Oldsmobile and then held on to it for three years before it was placed on the stolen Ford Fairmont the night of the murder. But Lenny's involvement suggested another, more alarming possibility. It immediately told us that likely Mike Gillich, a person we described as a Dixie Mafia banker, who often held stolen goods, jewelry, money, etc. for the Dixie Mafia, was also likely involved or very knowledgeable of what had happened to the Sherrys. Mike Gillich had been on Keith's radar for years. A 1978 federal intelligence report described Gillich as, quote, a dominant Dixie Mafia type with considerable influence with the criminal element in southern Mississippi. And yet, in Biloxi, most people knew Gillich only as Mr. Mike, the friendly and benevolent local strip club operator. A local reporter named Anita Lee once wrote an investigative profile of Gillich for the Biloxi Sun-Herald. He was uh, just an unassuming, mild-mannered-looking guy standing in front of his strip club on uh, U.S. on the highway out there, watching the traffic go by on a daily basis. You'd see him out there in his um, khakis and casual shirt, just watching the traffic go by. And he would meet with his buddies over at the Krispy Kreme. In the course of her reporting, however, Anita spoke to cops who shed light on Gillich's criminal background and his reputation as a Dixie Mafia confidant. He was also a stand-up guy. I mean, there was a reason other criminals came to Mike for this or that. They knew... What he did for them wasn't going anywhere. He wasn't going to be talking about it. He was very low-key, so they could trust him. When Anita arrived in Biloxi in 1987, Mike Gillich's strip clubs were the only ones remaining inside the city limits. Former Biloxi cop Gerald Forbes explained why. What I can tell you about Mike Gillich is that Biloxi Police Department, Narcotics and Vice Unit Investigations, was pretty successful over about a 10-year period of closing every strip club in the city of Biloxi except three. All three were owned by Mike Gillich. Never got them closed. They had the same information, the same violations. Never got closed. I understood why. I couldn't prove why. What did you understand? He was being protected. Anita said that honest Biloxi cops' inability to shut Gillich down caused many of them to quit the force in despair. I had a Biloxi police officer tell me, we tried, we failed. What can I say? Biloxi was our Vietnam. One unseen consequence of the club's continued operation was that they offered a safe haven to remaining members of the Dixie Mafia, which, though diminished over time, was still very much alive in the late 80s. Keith Bell understood this better than anyone. Since arriving on the Gulf Coast in 1982, he had helped take down two of the biggest Dixie Mafia-related figures on the Gulf Coast, Biloxi club owner DJ Venus and Harrison County Sheriff Leroy Hobbs. Like Gerald Forbes, 
Keith knew that forces inside Biloxi city government were protecting Mike Gillich. And so, when he learned that Gillich may have had something to do with the Sherry murders, he wasn't about to tell the Biloxi Police Department. Instead, he leaked it to the few cops he trusted. And then he started preparing for what would turn out to be the biggest investigation of his career. Keith Bell was born and raised in Gulfport, a 20-minute drive down the coast from Biloxi. He knew what he wanted to do for a living at an early age. In many ways, he'd been preparing for the Sherry case all his life. In about the seventh grade, I decided I wanted to be an FBI agent. I'd read quite a bit about agents, and eventually the FBI show came on TV with an actor named Ephraim Zimblist, who played an FBI inspector. And it showed him flying all around the country and solving all these big cases. And I said, that looks good to me. I'd like to do that. So I sort of geared my future and my plans and my studying and my conduct to, uh, to be an FBI agent. Keith followed his dream and graduated from Quantico at 24, well below the average age. He asked to be assigned somewhere close to home. Of course, I was opening my envelope thinking I was going to perhaps Atlanta, New Orleans, or Jackson, and it said San Francisco. So uh, not exactly what I was expecting. But the California assignment proved to be a boon for Keith's career. Over the next decade, he worked some of the biggest federal cases in U.S. history. In Oakland, he investigated the Hells Angels. The black-jacketed motorcycle gang with a taste for violence. And uh, I recall interviewing the president, an individual named Sonny Barger. This man probably knows more about the Hells Angels than anyone. He is Sonny Barger. At a uh, prison uh, in California. As part of the FBI's major crime squad, Keith handled extortions, kidnappings, aircraft hijackings, and protection of foreign officials. In 1974, he helped track down members of the Symbionese Liberation Army, a group of armed radicals who kidnapped 19-year-old newspaper heir Patty Hearst and bombed the Hearst Castle. But uh, eventually we tracked them across town to 54th Street in Los Angeles. And that evening, there was probably the largest shootout in the history of the FBI. Five suspected members of the Symbionese Liberation Army are dead following the bloodiest and most massive gun battle in the history of Los Angeles. That was one case, of course, uh, I remember very well. A few years later, Keith played a key role in one of the most notorious abduction cases of all time, the Chowchilla bus kidnapping. This would have been around 1976 and this entire busload of school children disappeared. They left on a bus, they returned on a bus. They are safe, the ordeal is over. The 26 school children from Chowchilla kidnapped late Thursday afternoon. We were able to track down the perpetrators of that. Keith built a stellar resume in California. By the late 70s though, Keith was craving a return home to the Gulf Coast. Not just to be closer to family and friends, but to seek his teeth into the crime and corruption then plaguing the region. At the time, the only federal agent conducting corruption investigations in Harrison County, which includes both Gulfport and Biloxi, was a guy named Royce Hignight. I said, well, I need some help down here. And I said, you know, if, if I had somebody working with me all the time, if they decided to do something to me, they got to do something to both of us or it won't do them any good. Agent Royce Hignight already assigned to Gulfport, said, hey, I need some help down here on the coast. We've got a corrupt sheriff, a corrupt sheriff's department, and they're releasing murders. They're not investigating murders. They're taking payoffs or covering up drug trafficking. They're hiding out Dixie Mafia fugitives, refusing to execute arrest warrants. And so in 1982, the FBI finally shipped Keith back to Gulfport, Mississippi. According to Hignight, one of the most dangerous men in Harrison County was its current sheriff, Leroy Hobbs. The respected former police chief in Gulfport, Hobbs had turned to the dark side during his time as sheriff. He had openly befriended members of both the Dixie Mafia and the Italian Mafia, which had found a foothold in Mississippi as authorities pushed them out of New Orleans. So, 
In August of 82, Roy Signight and I team up as co-case agents and start trying to develop a prosecutable case against the sheriff and any other corrupt deputies and any corrupt Dixie Mafia members that were involved with them. When Leroy Hobbs was elected sheriff of Harrison County in 1972, he was just 38 years old. He replaced the notoriously corrupt Luther Patton, who, among other things, had owned a stake in a local brothel called The Graduate. Many believed Hobbs would usher Biloxi and Harrison County into a new era. Well, uh, Hobbs was considered an honest, straightforward police chief of the city of Gulfport. In fact, He was one of the few officers selected to attend the FBI National Academy at Quantico, Virginia. Like his predecessors, Hobbs promised to clean up the Biloxi Strip. During his first month in office, he organized what the press called a vice summit with local cops, politicians, and club owners, many of whom had Dixie Mafia ties. Together, they drew up rules saying clubs would not offer prostitution, nude stripping, or gambling and would refrain from employing pimps and convicted felons. District Attorney Albert Niekase, who'd never had a drop of alcohol or smoked a cigarette in his life, told the club owners, We don't expect you to put a steeple on your buildings, just to abide by the law. The club owners promised to do just that. Hobbs was praised for his proactive approach. A month later, undercover state police investigators surveyed the strip to measure the new sheriff's progress. They found that prostitution, nude stripping, and gambling were more prevalent than ever. Rather than rid Biloxi of vice, Hobbs had taken it up a notch. Not long after he took office, a surveillance report said that Hobbs was, quote, easily influenced by anyone with money and a good-looking woman. Investigators documented his presence at Gulf Coast strip clubs like the Foxy Lady, Papa Bears, and the Gringo's Room. Former Biloxi cop Gerald Forbes described a run-in his brother had with Hobbs around this time. He was working as a bartender in a place on the beach called DJ's, Stereo Lounge. It was owned by a guy named DJ Venus. In addition to running the club, DJ Venus was a reputed Dixie Mafia gangster and gun runner who trafficked marijuana from a farm he owned north of Biloxi. My brother told me that one night while he was working, the bar he went in the bathroom and he was doing a little coke on the counter, and Leroy came in and did some lines with him. And my brother was a lot of things. He wasn't a liar. During his first term, Hobbs didn't so much enable the Dixie Mafia as become an honorary member, their man on the inside. Here's Keith Bell again. The word started getting around to other law enforcement that he was accepting payoffs and bribes to let people out of jail, uh, to arrange for charges to be dropped. Hobbs handed out signed commission deputy cards to known members of the gang, which allowed them to carry weapons and even make arrests. He enacted a secret free-for-fee policy in which Dixie Mafia burglars and hitmen could pay their way out of Harrison County Jail. He even befriended Henry Salisbury, a.k.a. Hatchet Henry, the same psychopathic killer who'd once made saddles in prison for five-year-old Kirksey Nix. Under Hobbs, Biloxi cemented its reputation as a home base for the nomadic Dixie Mafia, whose wives and girlfriends often found work as strippers in the clubs. The Jackson Clarion Ledger would later refer to the Gulf Coast at this time as wide open and wicked. Here's Agent Royce Hignite. At one time during the 70s, we had like three gangs or four gangs of uh, these Dixie Mafia types that robbed banks all, all over the country, you know, just moving in and out. This is the kind of atmosphere that they operated in. So, I mean, it's just a, an, an atmosphere of crime and violence. Despite Hobbs' open affiliation with local crime figures, Harrison County residents approved of his laissez-faire approach to vice. They re-elected him in 1976 and again in 1980. Local cops, meanwhile, were either complicit with Hobbs or reluctant to intervene. Joe Price, a former Mississippi Highway Patrolman who later served as sheriff himself, 
knew and respected Hobbs when he was Gulfport's police chief. He regrets not doing more to help. I always felt like if we had helped him a little better, uh, that he may have not have got involved like he did. But we, we didn't because we didn't want it touching us. But sometimes you had to keep your mouth shut if you wanted your job. By the early 80s, Hobbs's reckless behavior was too obvious to ignore. When Keith Bell was reassigned to Gulfport in 1982, some honest local officers were already cooperating with the feds. And they soon got a lucky break. In March of 82, the body of a Biloxi strip joint owner and drug dealer named Dewey D'Angelo was found in the trunk of a Lincoln Continental in a supermarket parking lot outside Biloxi. Dewey D'Angelo was kidnapped from his modest Biloxi home. When police opened up the trunk to his Lincoln Continental, they found a grisly sight. Investigators later determined that a contract killer hired by a rival club owner named DJ Venus had stabbed him nine times, slit his throat, and cut his ear off with a Bowie knife. Biloxi businessman DJ Venus III was charged with the capital murder of D'Angelo. Venus allegedly hired James Edward Kramer to do the killing. In grand jury testimony, Kramer described the murder in graphic detail. I hit him hard with the butt of my gun. Dewey fell down. I told him we were going for a ride. I told him to get into the trunk of the car. Then I cut off his ear. I made him put the ear in his mouth and bite it. From grand jury testimonies, Keith learned that the killer was instructed to leave D'Angelo's body in Harrison County. That way, Leroy Hobbs could control the investigation. Well, this case was another indication and proof, basically, that the sheriff was covering up and protecting Dixie Mafia members down here. The Fed surveillance of Hobbs had already concluded that he was a, quote, vulnerable target for any strike force type investigation. So, in the summer of 1983, Keith and Royce Hignite put a plan in motion. We decided to set up a so-called sting operation in which we would have guys that were working for us but pretending to be drug dealers, major drug dealers and cartel dealers out of Colombia, South America, to try to approach the sheriff here and pay the sheriff to protect hundreds of kilos being uh, airdropped in South Mississippi. As part of the sting, Keith recruited an FBI informant who had worked as a narcotics smuggler and also knew DJ Venus personally. So he sort of uh, initiated the plan and introduced the plan to DJ. Hey, you know, we can make big money. We're going to bring in hundreds of kilos of cocaine from South America. We have Colombian cartel members involved. We'll pay the sheriff to protect us. DJ liked the idea. According to Keith, he recruited his Dixie Mafia associates and several family members to act as the ground crew. Once the 600 kilos of cocaine dropped from the sky and landed on a farm DJ owned just north of Biloxi, the ground crew would recover it and haul it away. Over the next few weeks, undercover agents from the FBI and DEA held several meetings with the ground crew to discuss logistics of the drop. During one of the meetings, Keith said, Sheriff Hobbs showed up. He agreed to protect the shipment if the money was right. He had assigned any deputies in that area to other parts of the county, and he personally would come out with his chief deputy and protect each end of the rural highway when the drop was going down about daylight. The day of the shipment, Keith and Royce got in an unmarked car and headed down a rural road to DJ Venus's farm. And we're looking for Leroy Hobbs to see if he actually is going to show up and protect the shipment. So as we're going south from the general area of the farm, we meet Leroy Hobbs coming north. I'm driving south, he's coming north, and he's in his, you know, plain sheriff's car. But we know his car, of course, from previous contact and surveillances. So we spot him, and of course, he spots us because we're the only two cars on the road at that time of morning in that particular area. 
and he takes off northbound and I make a, basically a U-turn and head back after him. And we see him throwing stuff out of the passenger side window of his sheriff's car. So we chase him down. He eventually pulls over. He surrenders. We handcuff him. When Keith slapped the cuffs on Hobbs, agents positioned north of the farm encountered Hobbs' right-hand man. The chief deputy was standing by his car with an M16 protecting the shipment on the north end. So he was arrested immediately. And then the SWAT teams moved in on the ground crew, and most of them, of course, surrendered immediately. On the drive back to the Gulfport Agency, Hobbs surprised Keith by claiming the FBI was interfering with his own sting operation. And he tells us he doesn't know why we're handcuffing him. He's conducting his own undercover narcotics investigation. Well, just a couple nights previously, during a meeting at the farm, we had paid him 15000 cash in FBI money. When Keith asked what happened to the money, Hobbs claimed he hadn't had a chance to put it into evidence. His attorney would deliver it to the Gulfport agency the very next morning, he promised. What Hobbs didn't know is that Keith had diligently Xeroxed all the bills prior to the handoff. When the attorney arrived the next morning with a briefcase containing $15,000 in $100 bills, Keith quickly ascertained that 11 of them had already been switched out. Meaning Leroy had spent 1100 of it already and had replaced it with new $100 bills to make it add up to a total of $15,000. So his big claim of conducting uh, under his own undercover uh, investigation fell apart pretty rapidly after that occurred. Hobbs was indicted in June of 1983, and the feds prosecuted him under the RICO Act, a tool used to take down the mafia. In a RICO case, you have to name a criminal enterprise. And as I recall, in the RICO case, We named the Harrison County Sheriff's Department as the criminal enterprise, which was a little unusual. That's not done too often where you name a whole agency as the uh, criminal enterprise. Hobbs ultimately pled guilty to racketeering and drug conspiracy charges and was sentenced to 20 years in federal prison. His co-conspirator, DJ Venus, was also convicted on RICO charges and given 20 years. These and other convictions drastically curtailed Dixie Mafia activities on the Gulf Coast. With Hobbs out of the picture, Biloxi City government finally succeeded in shutting down most of the strip joints and illegal gambling clubs, except for those owned by Mike Gillich, the unassuming Biloxi native who spent afternoons drinking coffee with cops and lawyers at the local Krispy Kreme on Beach Boulevard. Keith knew that Gillich was offering safe harbor and financial support to Dixie Mafia criminals from around the country. But by the mid-80s, Keith was paying more attention to Gillich's old friend, Kirksey Nix. Because even though Kirksey was serving a life sentence at the Louisiana State Penitentiary, his name had emerged in connection with a bizarre crime emanating from within the prison walls. So when I got there and I saw this, I'm walking to Chow. I noticed a kind of a little traffic jam down there because it's a long, long walkway you have to walk on. You have to walk maybe almost a quarter of a mile to the Chow Hall. This is Jimmy Cox, a former inmate at the Louisiana State Penitentiary, more commonly known as Angola. He's talking about his first day in prison in 1976. When I got up to where the traffic jam was happening, I noticed the dude was laying on the walk, all stabbed up, and people were just stepping over him. Wasn't even paying him no mind, wasn't seeing if he needed, you know, help if he was dead or what, you know? And so that set the stage for me right there. And what did you think when you saw that? What I thought? I'm in the jungle. Jimmy had been sentenced to 40 years for an armed robbery he committed in New Orleans. He was appalled by the conditions at Angola. Between 1969 and 1974, 53 prisoners were murdered by other inmates, 
earning Angola the nickname the bloodiest prison in America. A federal district judge said the conditions, quote, shock the conscience of any right-thinking person. He instituted a series of reforms that included ending Angola's inmate guard policy, a cost-cutting measure in which inmates were given firearms and pocket knives and allowed to supervise the prison population. For Jimmy, the reforms didn't seem to have an effect. He immediately started making plans to escape. I had more time than I could do. My discharge date was in the stratosphere. And so uh, my main focus was on trying to get away, but we're sitting on an 18,000 acre farm surrounded by the Mississippi on one side and the Tunica Hills and panthers and bears and rattlesnakes on the other side. So I knew I had to do something with a little more finesse to it than just trying to run through the bushes. Angola got its name because it sits on a former slave plantation whose workers were taken from the African nation of Angola. When the Louisiana State Penitentiary was relocated to the plantation in the late 19th century, convicts were subleased to local landowners whose workforce had vanished with the abolition of slavery. Inmates worked the fields, primarily picking cotton. Those who disobeyed were whipped. It was slavery by another name. When Jimmy Cox arrived in the mid-70s, things didn't look that different. The prison's overwhelmingly black inmate population still worked the fields, earning two cents an hour. The predominantly white guards monitored them on horseback, armed with shotguns. Jimmy was still reconciling himself to this bleak environment when a new inmate named Kirksey McCord Nix appeared on his unit. The first day I met him, he had a Lucia McCoy watch on, and the face of the watch was a gold doubloon. And uh, he had a couple gold rings on his finger. You know, my kind of guy. <laughs> Jimmy and Kirksey came from different worlds. Jimmy's father was a bona fide Chicago gangster whose best friend was Sam Giancana, boss of the mafia's Chicago branch. Kirksey, by contrast, was the privileged son of Oklahoma attorneys. But he and Jimmy became fast friends. For some reason, Kirksey and I just hit it off. You know, I'm sure you've met people and, you know, you just become fast friends. And Kirksey and I did. I always liked the fact he had a lot of class. Kirksey arrived at Angola a year after Jimmy in 1977. Following his conviction for the murder of New Orleans grocer Frank Corso, he had served five years at Leavenworth, a federal prison in Kansas, on a gun violation charge. But that didn't prepare him for life at Angola. I was writing a letter to a girl in Oklahoma City, and the guy who came in the TV room and said, excuse me, and stepped over one bench, said, pardon me, and stepped over the other bench and stabbed the kid right in the heart. He dropped and he was dead. The fact that Kirksey's dad was a criminal court judge didn't help matters. He knew he had to be on his best behavior. I was a judge's son, so like the girls say, they have to be twice as good as the men to get certain professional jobs. I felt I had to be twice the convict. I had to do everything the right way. I had to stand my ground. I had to do everything the right way, and I did. Kirksey was physically unimposing, his body gone soft after years in prison, but he quickly developed a formidable reputation. What was his reputation? Don't fuck with him. People knew Kirksey, uh, Nix's reputation was don't fuck with him. I don't like to say certain things, but it wouldn't be healthy, you know, to fuck with him. You don't know what might come your way. I might come your way, Another guy might come your way. You didn't know. Kirksey's reputation as a leader of the Dixie Mafia had hurt him on the outside, getting his name in the paper and leading cops to accuse him of things he claims he never did. But inside Angola, that reputation was an asset. Well, people know who he is. Ain't nobody gonna mess with him. A lot of times after, you know, you got your reputation solidified, Well, you don't have to do the shit you used to have to do. You know, they've written buku articles about him and everything else. I mean, if you don't, if you want to know anything about Kirksey Nix, it's easy to find out whether you got the internet or not. Still, Kirksey's reputation didn't exempt him from performing hard labor at Angola. 
I'm in a place where they pay you two cents an hour to pick cotton all day. Hey. And if you didn't, and when I first got there, they used to whip you. You know, we worked in the field. We picked cotton. We pulled cotton stalks, dug ditches, cut grass with brush hooks under a shotgun guard. When he wasn't working in the fields, Kirksey was busy trying to earn his release. After multiple appeals were rejected, he filed an application to the Louisiana Board of Pardons in 1979, asking them to cut his sentence to time served. His mother, Patricia, appeared at the hearing, as did Gene Fields and Marion Corso, who pleaded with the board to keep Kirksey locked up for life. In the end, the five-person board unanimously denied his pardon bid. Kirksey was crushed. For the first time in his life, he said, he contemplated suicide. And yet, being denied parole also imbued him with a sense of freedom. You know, Janis Joplin said, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. If you're not ever going to let me out of prison and I'm doing a life sentence, I felt like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's when Jimmy helped me with the scams and I started scamming. Because you felt you had nothing left to lose. Yeah. What did I have? <laughs> what did I have? While Kirksey was losing patience with life in Angola, Jimmy Cox was searching for ways to make money inside the prison walls. When I got to Angola, you know, I was dealing a little drugs and doing this, trying to make a hustle because you have to make money to live in there. And then I'd heard stories about this little piece of shit named Bobby Fabian that hustled homosexuals and stuff like that. Bobby Joe Fabian was doing life for kidnapping and shooting a Louisiana state trooper. But he'd made a name for himself at Angola as a talented con man. Jimmy heard that he was operating a profitable Lonely Heart scam directed at gay men around the country, and he wanted Bobby to teach him how it worked. But he would never show anyone I said, man, show me how that hustle works. Yeah, I ain't got time for all that. You know, get your own. That's how he treated all of us when we'd ask. Not long after that, Jimmy achieved his dream and actually escaped from Angola. It's a long and crazy story, but the gist is that he got himself admitted to Charity Hospital in New Orleans, where he slipped out of his cuffs, put on his neighbor's clothes, and walked out. He was apprehended a year later in California and brought back to Angola, where they placed him on a special tier for dangerous convicts. It was there that he had occasion to speak with Bobby Joe Fabian again. Lo and behold, you know, God works in mysterious ways. I was out on my exercise hour. I, I was locked up 23 hours a day, got out for an hour. And Bobby Fabian showed up and they had put him in the shower because they was going to put him on his tier with me. He was scared to death. I mean, I mean I'm talking about literally scared to death. Bobby was scared because he'd ratted on other inmates, and he was expecting some retaliation from men on this new tier. He said, man, Jimmy, these people here, now, I, I don't know if I can live right here, man. I saw you can handle it, Bobby. I'm going to make sure of that. Jimmy offered Bobby protection on the condition that Bobby teach him the scam. Bobby agreed. As Bobby explained it, he was placing personal ads in newspapers and magazines around the U.S. that catered to the gay community, identifying himself as a fictitious 23-year-old gay man named Eddie. Eddie was seeking a warm, sincere relationship and, quote, willing to relocate for the summer or permanently if love blooms. Jimmy adjusted the scam's language to suit his style. He found almost immediate success, particularly from ads placed in San Francisco's historic LGBT magazine, The Advocate. And that was the gold mine. I, I used to use the name Jimmy Hungwell Cox. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I got a lot of bites on that now. And I was younger, you know, and I was in good shape. And I'd take a picture with my shirt off. And, and I would use that picture sometimes. Then I had a whole file thing of younger boys, like 19, 20, 21, and I would use that. It was sort of like panning for gold. You know, you might write 20 letters out and you might get an answer to three of them, but those three might be all you ever need. 
Jimmy stayed on the tier for seven or eight months, at which point he rejoined the general population. That's when I ran into Kirksey and uh, I explained this game to Kirksey. He couldn't believe it. And what Bobby had showed me, he says, you tell every mark to send you between 10 and 20 bucks a week. And that doesn't seem like a lot. But if you got a hundred of them doing that, that's a lot of money. And so when I was telling Kirksey about how much money I was making, he couldn't believe it. He said, are you bullshitting me, Jimmy? Don't lie to me. I'm your boy, you know? I said, I'm not lying, Kirksey. The next day, Jimmy set out to prove the scam was making money. When you'd get a money order at Angola, the cashier department would write on the outside like $20 in a red ink pen. The next day at mail call, I got about 20 of them. I took them out there and I showed them to Kirksey. He said, oh, we got to talk. And so I started explaining what I could about it. Kirksey instantly took to the scam. He found he had a natural aptitude for it. It would be gay, white, male, seek sincere, loving relationship. But nah, I don't smoke, don't drink, blah, blah, blah. You'll get at least 100 letters and you'll get about 50 that are good and about 35 of them will have a phone number. Right. And that's how it starts. That's how it starts. Before long, Kirksey discovered ways to improve the scam and bring in more money. I wasn't educated at that time. I still had a, you know, basic literacy problem, you know? But Kirksey, being who he is and how smart his ass is, he found out all types of different ways to go about it. He showed me some stuff that blew my mind. Oh, he was sharp. Like what? Well, just little techniques we could use. Those techniques included something called phone freaking. Here again, Kirksey's electronics background came in handy. Using an 80s era Watson watch, he could mimic dial tones that phone companies used, allowing him to make free long distance calls from the Angola phone booth. Well, there's two, two ways you have on a telephone. It has call party control or calling party control. When the calling party hangs up, you get a dial tone. And if it's the other way around, you don't. So I, I would make a legal call to my mother and I'd talk for 20 seconds and get off the phone and then start calling marks. And when they hang up, I'd get a dial tone. I'd hold my watch up to the phone. The watch had a dialer in it. And so you could program numbers into it. You could hold the watch up to the phone and redial another number. By now, Kirksey was done picking cotton. He'd been accepted into Angola's vocational school and wound up running the prison's TV repair shop. Around that time, he did a favor for a guard in exchange for unlimited access to the phones. He put all of his spare time and abilities into the scam, including his powers of persuasion. One afternoon, he showed me how it was done. Hi, Jed. How you doing? I'm doing a lot better now. Month before last was my bad month. That's when my mom died, and I bought a car to go to the funeral, and on the way back, I dented it. And then the guy said I didn't have permission to use it, but, but I really did. But they believe him and not me. I could have uh, got probation, but, you know, that would have followed me all my life like the tail of a snake. So I got to join this boot camp, and uh, there's calisthenics and, and uh, group therapy sessions. And when I get done, I don't have any record of ever having been in trouble. I just don't think he had uh, insurance for somebody under 19. I don't want to hurt anybody, and I don't want to be hurt. I have a lot of love in my heart for the right person. So Jed, that... Jed, Jed, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. I don't want nobody to have me but you. Hello. <laughs> Kirksey and Jimmy weren't the only Angola inmates scamming gay men over the phone. But Jimmy and Kirksey had the biggest ambitions. And some of the guys that were doing the scams, they couldn't reach out that far. And they were happy with getting $10 here, $50 here, $100 here, you see? Where we were more interested in getting thousands of dollars sent to a different place, you see? The point being that I was able to take the game to a different level, I, I, I took it from people trying to get a super radio or some tennis shoes 
I had larger needs. When you miss money, you figure out what you should have said to make money, and we just got better at it and better at it, and uh, by the time you talk to 100 or 200 or 500 people, there's hardly anything they can say or ask that you don't know a good answer for. I learned how to make them chase their money. In June 1984, as Kirksey was taking the scam to a new level, Jimmy Cox escaped again. Despite having escaped from New Orleans Charity Hospital four years earlier, prison officials somehow allowed him to return after he'd intentionally stabbed himself in the eye. This time, hospital guards were keeping a closer watch. My escape plan was all ready together, and uh, I just had to stab the guard at the hospital to facilitate it. In August of 84, I was uh, sitting in the Bergen Fish and Hunt Club in Queens drinking a beer with John Gotti. I was looking for work, and he had work. Jimmy stayed on the lam for a few years this time, and he lost touch with Kirksey. Through the grapevine, he learned that he had elevated the scam to an art form and was reaping the rewards. I mean, he was making some fucking outlandish money, you know? Special Agent Keith Bell was also aware of the scam's success, thanks to an Angola informant who tipped off the FBI in 1984. But Angola lay outside of Keith's jurisdiction. And for reasons that would later become clear, other agencies declined to act. The FBI's interest in the scam would not be revived until after the Sherrys were killed in 1987. This time, Keith Bell was the catalyst. While examining phone records from the Halat Sherry law firm, Keith discovered that hundreds of calls had been exchanged with a phone number in West Feliciana Parish, Louisiana. That number, he soon learned, belonged to the Louisiana State Penitentiary. It was like, if you think there's a conspiracy, you have to prove that. We can't just get the, the feds involved without evidence of this. All right, after months, of working on your parents' case and working to bring it to light of, of whom may have killed your parents. What can you tell us about that? Was it emotionally difficult for you? There's nothing that's emotionally difficult after you get past the fact that someone felt it necessary to shoot your parents in the head. I uh, could not stop this investigation now if I wanted to, and I certainly don't want to. It will go on whether I'm dead or alive. Thank you for listening to Gone South, a creation and production of C-13 Originals, a Cadence 13 studio. Executive produced by Chris Corcoran, Chief Content Officer and Founding Partner of Cadence 13, along with Jed Lipinski, Tom Lipinski, and Ken Lee. Written and narrated by me, Jed Lipinski. Directed and produced by Lloyd Lockridge. Produced by Tom Lipinski. Edited by Alistair Sherman. Mixed and mastered by Chris Basil. Production support by Ian Mont, Margot Gray, Bill Schultz, Bob Tabador, and Sean Cherry. Original music written and performed by Casey Wayne McAllister. Artwork by Kurt Courtenay. Marketing, PR, sales, and operations and business affairs by Maura Curran, Josefina Francis, Hilary Schuff, Lauren Vieira, Lucas Santroen, Lizzie Roberti, Danny Kutrick, and Karen Andrews. Cadence 13 is an Odyssey company.